Hi. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone who is here today. Thank you for joining us at the inaugural Asian Society of Pediatric Anesthesiologists, FedEx Special Interest Group Forum. As everyone settles in, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce ESPAS Cardiac Special Interest Group. The idea of a cardiac SIG came about during the 2021 ESPA virtual meeting organized by Singapore. There were people who indicated an interest, and here we are now. The cardiac specialist interest groups realized that pediatric cardiac anesthesiologists are a very small group. Some centers do more, others not as much. And we realized that collective knowledge and group wisdom is the way forward. Therefore, we want to create a platform to share insights and expertise with the vision of improving standards of pediatric cardiac care in the region. It has taken us a while, but I'm thrilled to announce that this has finally come to fruition. If this calls out to you and might be of interest to you, I will urge you to scan the QR code and leave us our details so we can be in touch. These are the current members of the SIG. The members met in December last year for our first meeting and have planned a series of four sessions for 2023. The first two sessions will cover children with congenital heart disease for non-cardiac surgery, and the next two sessions on ICU-related issues for patients after cardiac surgery. We have a great lineup today, and I can't wait for us to begin. Today, we will have four speakers addressing different topics in patients with congenital heart disease presenting for non-cardiac surgery. The first lecture will give us an overview and the subsequent lectures will discuss three different case scenarios. Before we begin, allow me to introduce myself. I'm Angela. I'm a consultant anesthesiologist at KK Women's and Children's Hospital, Singapore. I completed my fellowship training in pediatric, pediatric as well as pediatric cardiac anesthesia in Boston Children's Hospital. Together with me is Dr. Pichaya Waitaya Winu, and we will be co-moderating the session together. Dr. Pichaya is Associate Professor in the Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care, Siriraj Hospital, Mahidol University, Bangkok, Thailand. She completed her fellowships in her com completed pediatric fellowships in Children's National Hospital and George Washington University Hospital, USA. She also completed a fellowship in neuroanesthesia in Harbor View Medical Center, University of Washington. She's currently the secretary of Pediatric Anesthesia Club in Thailand. Before we begin, here are some reminders. To allow others to hear better and to minimize interruptions, please mute your microphone at all times during the presentation. If you have questions during the presentation, please do use the chat function. However, we do welcome questions and discussions during the Q&A, so please raise your hands and allow us to identify you before unmuting yourself. There will be some poll questions before the start of each presentation. When a poll is launched, you will be prompted to answer the poll questions. You will have about 30 seconds to respond and submit your answer. We will share the results soon after we end the poll. After the result is shared, you may close the poll so that you can see the, the slide shared by our speakers. We will also issue a certificate of attendance upon completion of the survey and MCQ questions after this talk. There will be a QR code that is sent uh, at the end of this talk, so please, please watch out for it. This forum will be recorded and uploaded onto the following social media platforms, such as um, the, our website, Facebook, and YouTube. Without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Pichaya to get the ball rolling. Dr. Pichaya, please. Thank you, Dr. Angela, for your nice introduction. So um, I am so honored to be uh, one part of this uh, talk today. So first of all, um, before we start the talk, um, I would like to share uh, a slide uh, polling questions. So we have two poll questions in a row. The first one is, which is considered a high risk case that requires a pediatric cardiac anesthesiologist um, support for non-cardiac surgery. So you have about 30 seconds to answer this.
And we're gonna have another poll question. Which condition requires infective endocarditis prophylaxis? So please choose one of the four. And then we shall see what, what is the poll look like. Okay, so for the first question about the high-risk case that requires a pediatric cardiac anesthesiologist, so most of you choose uncorrected BSD with moderate pulmonary artery hypertension for appendectomy. Thank you. So the, for the second question, which condition requires infective endocarditis prophylaxis? So the first rank is DORV, post three months modified baloctosic shunt for dental caries procedure. And another one that follow is uncorrected BSD with moderate pulmonary hypertension for appendectomy. So this is 56% uh, versus 36%. So let's find out in the next talk. So I'm gonna introduce our first speaker, Dr. Maliwan Ofu Wong. Dr. Maliwan is Associate Professor in Anesthesia. She works at Department of Anesthesiology at Faculty of Medicine, Prince of Songkhla Hospital at Southern part in, of Thailand. She received Certificate of Fellowship in Pediatric Cardiac Anesthesia from McGill University, Canada. She also received Certificate of Fellowship in Cardiac Anesthesia from British Columbia University, Canada. And she also a PhD in Epidemiology. She currently is a head division of cardiovascular thoracic anesthesia at Prince of Songkha University. Please do welcome Dr. Mali Wan. She will be giving us a talk about children with congenital heart disease for non-cardiac surgery. What do we need to know? Please welcome Dr. Mali Wan. Thank you, Dr. Pichaya, for the kind introduction. I would like to thank ESPA committee for giving me this opportunity for a talk about child with congenital heart disease for non-cardiac surgery. What do we need to know? I would like to present with the outline, how significant type of congenital heart disease, risk stratification for surgery, safe preoperative management for non-cardiac surgery. I would like to present with our real case in our hospital. A three year old boy presented with progressive cyanosis. He was a known case of DORV, TOF type, severe stenosis, severe pulmonic stenosis, and pulmonic valve hypopatia. He received percutaneous balloon pulmonic valvulotomy in March last year at the age of two. Last follow up with cardiology in August last year as well. He was advised for us urgent right body fiber lock toxic shunt and then he was lost for up. This admission, he come this year in January due to hypoxic spell from infection. He has acute hoditis media and multiple dental caries. His status, cyanosis, hypoxic spell two to three times, treat with oxygen support and liver fit. His medication, he was on propanerol, three milligram per day. His body weight was 10 kilo, saturation was 75% at the room air, and he has cuffing of finger. He has single S2, systolic ejection murmur, grade two at left upper parasternal border. His echo and his heart cath show DORV, TOF type with left to right shunt ASD, non rectative sub VSD, right to left shunt. Severe infundibular stenosis and mild valvular stenosis, pressure gradient as 41, and he has three map gas. So how significant of congenital heart disease children for surgery? It occurs in over 1% of newborns. POCA report risk of perioperative cardiac arrest is higher in these children, around 34%. 75% were under the age of two. 75% 75, 75 of deaths were encountered by three defects, which are aortic stenosis, cardiomyopathy, and single ventricle lesion. 19% mortality occur in the children with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. 
Poka also reported that the size of cardiac arrest in these children occur 54% in general OR, 27% in OR CVT, and 16% percent at the cath lab. So these children pose a serious challenge for anesthesia, especially in non-cardiac surgery. The most common congenital defects requiring invasive treatment in the first year of life, 55% is simple lesion, 30% is moderate, and 15% were complex lesion. Surgery can be divided into three groups. First, corrective surgery. Second, Parative surgery and third, uncorrected surgery. The preference of common complex and moderate complex cardiac disease, VSD is the most common, around 20%, tetralogy of faro, about 14%, crown position of grade artery, and coarctation of aorta, around 11%. What is the basic approach to congenital cardiac disease? in this patient. First, we need to assess if the patient is cyanotic. If no, it could have the left to right shunt like ASD, VSD, AV septal defect, or PDA. Or it could have obstructive lesion like coarctation of aorta. But if the patient is cyanotic, it could have right to left lesion like tetralogy of fallow or mixing lesion like transposition of great artery, truncus arteriosus, or DORV plus VAD, ASC like our patient. And we consider our patient is functional single ventricle. If the patient receive any corrective or parative surgery, yes, because it could result anatomy and residual defect. What is the current status? Now he was poorly compensated with significant limitation. What is the proposed procedure? Effect of the procedure and anesthetic management have on the patient pathophysiology. Does this patient need the infective endocarditis prophylaxis, which I will talk later. Consider the moderate complex high-risk cases were handled by cardiac or pediatric cardiac anesthesiologist. Dr. Lee report incident of cardiovascular event around 12% and respiratory event about 5%. These are the risk factors of CVS event like a high ASA, emergency, a major severe heart disease, single ventricle, also severe ventricular dysfunction. What are the safe preoperative management for non cardiac surgery? The medical examination and history of congenital heart disease. Physicians need to know the basic knowledge of anatomy, pathophysiology. The parents need to know the past history of treatments and the past operation, as we have informed consent is advised. The anesthesiologist and the team must know the extra cardiac malformation, assess New York Heart Association classification, as we add the severity of the children. 30% of these children was associated with abnormally like Down syndrome, arch obstruction, intracardiac defect. One third can have airway compression. Coronal truncal abnormally can increase the risk of chromosome 22Q11 deletion and vascular anomaly can occur. The sy systematic approach in congenital heart children, respiratory event, children with respiratory tract infection can occur in high Pulmonary vascular resistant children, what is oxygen saturation among of the pulmonary blood flow? Because high pulmonary blood flow can associate that with pulmonary artery hypertension, RV failure. For the CVS event, it could have arrhythmia, cardiac failure, and sudden death. Of course, previous echo and cardiac cath is very important. The current history of medication is he on aspirin? Diuretic, ACEI, antiarrhythmic, like this patient was on propanerol, and what is a preoperative electrolyte assessment because it could have metabolic acidosis or hypo or hyperkalemia. This patient have any prehypertension for our case set because he has a primary obstruction, so he was uh, 
doesn't have any pulmonary hypertension, hypertension. But for the children who have severe pulmonary hypertension, can increase risk of mortality eight times and risk of RV failure, pulmonary hypertensive crisis, bronchospasm, and sudden death. Of course, cardiac catheterization to look at the location of the defect, degree of stenosis, pressure gradient, shunt direction is important. Like our cases, have the ORV with right to left shunt VSD and also left to right shunt ASD. The method of risk assessment, I would like to take our patient for the example. So he was moderate risk. The other risk stratification for the high risk case are single vertical physiology before completion of the fontan, like hypoplastic left heart syndrome, tricuspid atresia, fontan circulation, or the children who receive fontan procedure, pulmonary hypertension, Williams syndrome that had supervalvular aortic stenosis mostly, and cardiomyopathy. With this high risk case, need train pediatric cardiac anesthesiologist for non-cardiac surgery. Patient with simple or moderate complication, completely corrected, well compensated, follow up regularly with cardiologist. The standard pediatric visit without a cardiology consultation is advised for a student who have moderate complication or complication, not well compensated, cyanotic or single ventricle. Recent cardio evaluation echo within three to six months before surgery, or if the patient condition had changed significantly since the last follow-up, should be evaluated again with the cardiologist and consider trained pediatric cardiac anesthesiologist to take care for the non-cardiac surgery. Pre-op preparation, all cardiac medication should be continued. Standard NPO in patient with Cyanotic lesion, shunt dependent patient, those with alpha tract obstruction is critical important. Not left NPO for a long period of time, should be scheduled early in the day, and if they are delayed, should be fed clear liquid until two hours before induction. Because hypervicosity syndrome is worse in the case after surgery if prolonged fasting occur. For the hematocrit, more than 60% can have so many symptoms and lead to neonatal coralopathy. Management with the hydration bloodletting should be due, should be advised, and also adequate infusion, very important for the prolonged NPO. Infective endocarditis is a life-threatening illness, difficult to treat and have serious consequences. The prevention the patient must have both cardiac indication and surgical procedure for our patient that have unrepaired cyanotic heart disease is one of the indication. But the other lesion like who has cardiac valve repair or previous endocarditis or have previous palliative or corrective operation within six months or still have residual defect or receive cardiac transplant. Presentation. This indication is indicated for IE prophylaxis as well as if the patient received dental procedure or respiratory tract procedure or skin musculoskeletal procedure needed for IE prophylaxis. Like this patient, if he, re if he received dental procedure, he needs the IE prophylaxis. In summary, the children with congenital heart disease has significant morbidity and mortality for non-cardiac surgery. We should assess if the patient is cyanosis, right to left, left to right, or the mixtion, if he has the high risk like more than moderate to severe, the need trained pediatric cardiologist, cardiac anesthesiologist is advised. Also, current medication, risk of pulmonary hypertension, hypervicosity, and IE prophylaxis is very important to assess before receive the procedure. I would like to continue our talk with the next speaker. Thank you so much for your attention. Hi, I understand we are facing some technical issues now. 
Um, just uh, give us a moment to try and sort this out. Um, just a while. Okay, we will carry on with our presentation. Thank you, Dr. Maliwan, for the very informative talk. The framework to approach patient definitely helps to formulate a plan for patient management. I find the risk assessment table particularly useful in helping to identify whether a patient is deemed high risk. Before we move on to our next speaker, we have another poll question. Which of the following is the earliest sign of pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary hypertensive crisis. You have four options to choose from. You have about 30 seconds to answer the question. For those who have questions about Dr. Maliwan's talk, please type your questions into the chat box below. Hey, we have our answers, we have our results from the poll. 57% of them of you mentioned desaturation as the earliest warning sign. 33% mentioned tachycardia and 7% mentioned hypotension. Our next speaker will address this question. We have our next speaker, Dr. Natapong Lepanenon. Dr. Natapong is head and attending anesthesiologist at the Department of Anesthesia, Queen Sirikit National Institute of Child Health, Bangkok. He obtained his fellowship in pediatric anesthesia at Alberta Children's Hospital, Canada. Dr. Natapong will now shed some light on the management of a child with VSD and pulmonary hypertension presenting for non-cardiac surgery. Please welcome Dr. Natapong. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Natapong Lepanadon from Queen's Medic National Institute of Child Health. Uh, it's just an honor for me to be here. So thank you, Dr. Sunirat for in, inviting me to join this session. And thank you for our moderator, Dr. Angela and Dr. Pichia. So my topic today is talk about cardiac murmur with non-cardiac surgery. So I think I'm happy uh, may experience this kind of cases in many forms, right? To uh, non cardiac surgery, such as dental procedure, or any single general surgery. So let's start with the case. Our case is three years old girl with Down syndrome with large membranous VSD and YTR and moderate pulmonary hypertension. She was scheduled for dental procedure under general anesthesia. Her current medication is corosimide. The lab result with normal index. ECC show normal standard rhythm and chest ray show cardiomegaly. Baseline oxygen saturation is 100%. And the common cause of cardiac murmur in Down syndrome for trees, most common is one, endocardial cushion defect or AVSD, two is VSD, and three, ASD. And our patient is VSD, is the second most common. Challenges in managing this patient are we deal with Down syndrome patients, so we know that Down syndrome has another or other associated problems, such as 
airway problem, airway obstruction, USA, the C spine instability, and some of them has hypothyroidism. And the most common problem in Down syndrome is congenital heart disease. So this patient has congenital heart disease with pulmonary hypertension. So the challenge is prevent the patient from pulmonary hypertensive crisis. About preoperative assessment, the routine analytic history and estimation should be done. This, and the specific evaluation for the kind of patient is the airway. So because of Down syndrome, as I mentioned earlier, as uh, airway problem like snoring or OSA. So we need to evaluate this kind of problem. And the respiratory, if our patient has recent URI symptom or LRI symptom, the procedure should be postponed. About cardiovascular system, you need to know current physical status, the recent evaluation of the cardiovascular system, such as echocardiogram, and we need to consult cardiologist to evaluate patient together. The IE prophylaxis for this kind of patient is necessary. She has scheduled for dental procedure that include tooth extraction. The tooth extraction is invasive dental procedure, so this patient needs IE prophylaxis. Investigation. We need complete blood count, electrolyte. So this patient has a uh, diuretic. Mm -hmm. So we need to do to have a uh, electrolyte ECT to eight. Uh, left heart or right heart hypertrophy, chest X-ray. So chest X-ray for this patient has cardiomegaly. Medication. She has diuretic for medication. So should I need to continue or stop in the day of the operation? Most of medication for congenital heart disease should be continued until the day of the operation. Another thing is when they disciplinary care, the physician that take care of this patient should and to discuss together to, to make the proper care for this patient include a discussion with the family. Assessment for the risk of the patient. According to some of the recommendations from the journal, this patient has high risk because of she has a lot of hypertension. The other risk assessment from another journal, she has cardiac vision for moderate risk, but she also has a Down's syndrome. Is that a comorbidity for the risk? So the result is she also has a high risk. Induction and maintenance. Two choice of induction such as Inhalation or induction, IV induction. Be careful to induction with inhalation in the syndrome patient because of they had a high incidence for bradycardia, especially the sevoflurane. Another choice is IV induction. Most common IV induction drugs is propofol and ketamine, but ketamine has more superior than propofol in the pulmonary hypertensive patient because of ketamine can increase mean air pressure but has no shape or little shape in systemic respiratory system and pulmonary respiratory system too. But propofol can decrease systemic respiratory system and mean air pressure. So we can use, but use with caution in the patient with pulmonary hypertension because propofol can 
precipitate the reverse shunt from left to right shunt to right to left shunt and cause all the hypertensive crisis. Another agent in the methanol, most of them has been an effect with the chan. We can use either isoferrin, sulfurin, narcotics, and benzodiazepine. The non depolarizing muscle relaxer can be used depending on the type of operation. But I refer it administration to be careful in the kind of patient that has depolarization because of it can cause volume problem and heart failure. Let's talk about pulmonary hypertension for this patient. Physiology of the congenital heart solution for this patient. She has last VSD. So last VSD can cause increased pulmonary blood flow from left heart to the right heart. Increased pulmonary blood flow can cause pulmonary blood flow resistance and so they may develop pulmonary hypertension. Now our patient, she had a moderate pulmonary hypertension, have about 50 to 75% of systemic arterial patient. If we cannot eliminate the factor that can cause pulmonary postural resistance increase, such as hypoxia, hypercarbia, Acidosis and symbolic simulation, it can cause rapid increase of pulmonary artery pressure or pulmonary vascular resistance. Um, the increasing of the pulmonary vascular resistance can cause right heart failure, reversion to right to left shunt, and can cause further hypoxia. And the next one, with the hypoxia, more hypoxia and can cause cardiac ischemia and can cause low cardiac output, airway edema, and can cause cardiac arrest and death. This, this is a vicious cycle. If we cannot eliminate this factor, what should we look for? The early warning sign for a pulmonary hypertensive crisis. The first is rapid drop of oxygen saturation, but you should rule out all the cause of the desaturation. This is a decrease in systemic or systolic blood pressure, and the other is tachycardia. This is this is the three most Common early warning sign for pulmonary hypertensive crisis. How to prevent? You should eliminate or avoid the cause of increasing pulmonary vascular resistance, hypoxia, hypercarbia, acidosis, hypothermia, and increased hemolytic simulation, increased airway pressure. Management of the pulmonary hypertensive crisis. We use 100% oxygen, inhale nitric oxide, or use the post cream, or we can also use the to support our function and use a method that can maintain SVR, such as risk pressure, or if uh, you are not available for ECMO. With the crisis of the pulmonary hypertension, you can activate the ECMO team to do. In the post-operative period, we need to do a smooth preservation and maintain the adequate ventilation, oxygen supplementation, and adequate pain control to avoid the factor that can increase the pulmonary vascular resistance. For the high risk patient, we need to close up in the high dependency ward or the intensive care unit. So take home assess for 
master chain. Some common continental heart disease can turn into a crisis, such as large VSD with this patient can cause only hypertension and chronic hypertensive crisis. And we know how to manage this kind of patient with chronic hypertension and how to prevent and how to treat the primary hypertensive crisis. If your hospital is didn't have a uh, wearable physician or expert to do to take care of this kind of patient, please refer to the further hospital that can manage this kind of patient. Okay, thank you for your attention. Feel free to ask any question or share your experience in the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Natapong, for your very informative talk. I think we do all used to um, Down syndrome patient quite uh, a lot. And uh, sometimes if the patient has congenital heart disease and um, pulmonary hypertension, uh, we now know how to manage it. So if you have any question for Dr. Natapong or for Dr. Maliwan earlier, just feel free to type in your question in the chat box. So I'm gonna start the next poll question. So uh, a patient with a BT shunt presents with sudden desaturation. It is crucial to rule out which condition. So you may choose between shunt blockage, major pulmonary collaterals, BT shunt too large, or right atrial thrombus. Okay, so 80, oh, 87 percent say change block it. Okay, so let's find out in the next talk. So um, there is an, uh, the next speaker. I would like to introduce Dr. Grit Pisan Pan. He is an attending anesthesiologist at Department of Anesthesiology, King Chulalongkorn Memorial Hospital in Bangkok, Thailand. He received Diploma of Thai Board of Anesthesiology, Thai Board of Cardiac Anesthesia, and also Thai Board of Pain Management. So Dr. Grit will be talking about cyanotic heart disease and non-cardiac surgery. Please welcome Dr. Grit. Good evening, everybody. Today, my topic is about uncorrected congenital heart disease for non-cardiac surgery. This is the case summary. Our patient was a one year and eight month old boy. He is diagnosed brain abscess, presenting for craniotomy. He is a known case of tetralogy of Fallot. He had undergone right BT shunt with history of occasional spells. On physical examination, he is found to be sick, drowsy, and dehydrated with visible cyanosis. His oxygen saturation was 81% on room air. The labs showed hematocrit was 70% with a baseline about 55%. Normal coagulation profile, the ECT showed right ventricular hypertrophy. The echo was compatible with the trilogy of Fallot with good ejection fraction. He is currently on propranolol and aspirin. The CT brain show cystic lesions with little mass effect. The trilogy of Fallot is the most common cause of cyanotic congenital heart disease and accounts for 10% of all congenital heart diseases. It had four features, ventricular septal defect, pulmonary stenosis, right ventricular hypertrophy, and overriding of aorta. Right to left shunting causes chronic hypoxemia in these patients and has many consequences, such as very high hematocrit levels, decreased capillary blood velocity, decreased perfusion, decreased oxygen supply in peripheral tissue, 
and increased risk of thromboembolism. These changes from chronic hypoxemia may lead to decreased ventricular function globally, increased SVR from increased blood viscosity, and coagulation complications such as thrombosis, especially with dehydration and coagulopathy. Let's talk about the modified BT shunt. A modified BT shunt is a surgically placed synthetic shunt connecting between a nominate or subclavian artery and the pulmonary artery. The goal of a modified BT shunt is the delivery of adequate pulmonary blood flow for an extended period of time until the child grows to a size suitable for a more definitive surgery. Ideally, the post-operative saturation should be around 75 to 80 percent after the BT shunt. So, from the previous slide, the child with BT shunt should have oxygen saturations between 75 to 80 percent. If the child with BT shunt has low oxygen saturations, the child would be cyanosis. The possible causes are the shunt blockage with thrombus systemic hypotension, small bleeding artery or small pulmonary artery, maybe the chance too small or inadequate ventilation. On the other hand, if the child with BT shunt has high oxygen saturations, the child may have symptoms of congestive heart failure. The causes are the use of high FiO2, the PDA may still open, or the child has MACAS, or major aortopulmonary collateral arteries, or the chance too large. We are having a very challenging situation here. A child with uncorrected cyanotic congenital heart disease presents with fragile cardiopulmonary status from chronic hypoxemia, hemodynamic instability, arrhythmias, spells, acid bed imbalance, coagulation problems, together with abscess-induced problems, such as seizures, high ICP, and meningitis. So from the previous talk from Dr. Maliwan, this child is at high risk for non-cardiac surgery because he has unrepaired cardiac lesions, and he also has BT shunt. So, should this patient be evaluated by cardiologist before the procedure? The answer is yes, because this patient has complex lesion. He is not well compensated and he's cyanotic. And he certainly needs a peat cardiac anesthesiologist. Preoperative assessment in this patient should include current cardiac and neurological status, like functional class, consciousness, associated complications, for example, any BT shunt complication or abscess-induced complication, assessment of shunt functioning by auscultation, current medications, for example, anticoagulant or antiplatelet, cardiology consultation for echocardiogram to evaluate cardiac and shunt function, coagulation profile, and volume status. The operative preparation. You should discuss the cardiac conditions and anticipate a plan of action with the child and the parents. Adequate perioperative hydration is very important in children with cyanotic congenital heart disease to prevent cyanotic spells. Premedication is usually desirable in cyanotic congenital heart disease since crying or sympathetic overactivity can make oxygenation and chanting words. But remember, oversedated in these patients can be very dangerous too. Level of anesthesia, prevention of air embolism by the airing all IV lines because this patient has both intra and extra cardiac shunts. Maintain of systemic blood pressure because systemic perfusion will control pulmonary blood flow and oxygenation in this patient. 
avoidance of drugs, or events that might increase PVR and make systemic oscillation worse. Avoidance of decreased myocardial contractility that might worsen systemic perfusion. And importantly, avoidance of increase in intracranial pressure. We should prepare for the cyanotic spells. Causes of cyanotic spells are surgical stimulation, dynamic right ventricular apple tract obstruction, hypovolemia, increased airway pressure, and decreased systemic vascular resistance. Treatments include calming, niches positioning, give oxygen, give fluid boluses, decreased apple tract obstruction with beta blocker, or increased SVR with alpha agonist. Should also prepare for block shunt. The signs of non functioning BT shunts are sudden severe desaturation with normal or low blood pressure, normal ventilations, normal ventilator parameters, normal air entry. On physical examination, there is no shunt murmur heard. Treatments are maintain hemodynamic stability, volume expansion, but remember, to give small boluses. May require vasopressors to maintain blood pressure. And don't forget to inform cardiologists. Anesthetic management, gentle separation from the parents, prevention of cyanotic spells. For example, prevent excessive crying and unnecessary painful procedures. And remember, this child has right BT shunt that compromise the arterial circulation of the right arm. So the blood pressure taken from the right arm may be inaccurate. So we should measure the blood pressure and establish the IV lines at alternative sites. With IV antibiotics, anticonvulsants, and anti-edema treatment, maintain hemodynamic stability and ventilation. Careful positioning to prevent peanut congestion and brain edema. Anesthetic drugs must be titrated and administered slowly. Ketamine is the ideal drug for the trial to follow, but should be cautiously used in intracranial surgery. Arterial blood gas is essential because power symmetry is less accurate in severe cyanosis. Maintain cerebral perfusion pressure and lax brain for neurosurgery. Cautious use of the diuretics, such as mannitol, to prevent dehydration because dehydration is not desirable in stenotic heart diseases. Cerebral perfusion pressure can be maintained by maintaining adequate systemic blood pressure. Avoid increases in ICP by not using nitrous oxide and use volatile agents less than 1 mg. Keep hematocrit around 45%. Avoid hypotension, hypovolemia, acidosis, hypoxia, hypocarbia, and hypothermia. Prevent paradoxical air embolism. Platelet transition associated with the risk of shunt failure and should be avoided. So we should discuss risks and benefits before giving platelet for this patient. For postoperative care in this patient, early extubation is preferred because positive pressure ventilation reduces pulmonary blood flow. We also need intensive monitoring and regular neurological observations. We need efficient and effective postoperative pain control. And lastly, appropriate fluid management. In summary, Non-cardiac surgery in a patient with uncorrected trilogy follow is reported to be associated with higher mortality. Anesthesia management of children with trilogy follow presenting for neurosurgery requires a good understanding of the pathophysiology of this condition. Carefully administer anesthesia with meticulous planning, judicious use of drugs combined with strict monitoring and vigilance can make a safe outcome. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Dr. Craig, for pointing out important aspects in managing a child with a BT shun. We have now come to the last two questions of the day. Question number five, would you proceed with laparoscopic surgery in a well fontan patient presenting for non-cardiac surgery? And question number six, in a fontan patient, patient presenting with acute appendicitis, which of the following options would you choose? You have about 40 to 50 seconds to answer the questions before we close the poll. Okay, thank you very much for answering the questions. So for question number one, um, majority of people said no, they will not proceed with laparoscopic surgery. Um, and 29% said yes, and 29% said maybe. Uh, for the second question, um, a majority of people chose proceed with surgery after optimization. All right. To help give us more insight in managing a patient with Fontan Sorry, to give us more insight in managing a patient in Fontan patient is Professor Sunirat Kunsaripong. Professor Sunirat Kunsaripong was in the Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care, Siraj Hospital, Mahido University, Bangkok, Thailand. She's a diplomat of American and Thai Board of Anesthesiology. She has a certificate of fellowship in research in cardiac anesthesia for Mayo Clinic. And she also has a um, certificate of fellowship in clinical cardiac anesthesia as well as critical care from the Mayo Clinic. On top of that, she also had a fellowship in pediatric anesthesia in the Boston Children's Hospital at Harvard University. Dr. Sunirat is, as a past president of ESPA, Professor Sunirat is not an unfamiliar face in this community. Professor Sunirat will now share her case of a Fontan patient presenting with acute appendicitis and share some insights. Professor Sunirat, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Professor Sunirat Kung Telepong from the Department of Anesthesiology, the Large Hospital Mahidon University. My talk today will be the growing content patient and non-cardiac surgery, anesthetic considerations. My patient today is a boy, seven years old, with underlying hypoplastic right heart ventricle, from the re-exaggerated state of post-finistrated in the atrial content operation with prosthetic AV while replacement at the age of three years old. Currently, he had abdominal pain, could not eat or drink well for two days. He was scheduled for emergency appendectomy from acute appendicitis. He was a full-term born, no other congenital anomaly, good exercise tolerance, last capitalization spatial patient administration with good flow and patent pulmonary brain. Last echo show good detection fraction 65%, competent AV well with my stenosis. No troubles was seen. He had dental extraction last year without any problem. From examination, the calculation was 96% on room air. Still have good capillarity, but look dehydrated and his hemoglobin was 15 grams, that is higher from baseline, about 13 grams per cent. Hematocrit was 50 per cent. Potassium was 3.2 and creatinine was 2.8. Elevated liver function and albumin levels 2.3. The INR was 2.4 from anticoagulant. I would like to introduce everyone to know about what is quantum how is the Fontan anatomy and physiology considerations? The Fontan operation is performed for patients with congenital heart lesion, for which a true ventricle repair is not achievable. This is a Fontan anatomy. The single ventricle serves as a systemic ventricle to provide the oxygenated blood systemically. If it delays it, Left ventricle to be a single ventricle, the outcome is better than the right ventricle. As you don't have the uh, ventricle to eject the blood to the lung, so all the pumping blood flow 
even directly from the central venous pressure from the blood flow from the SVC and IVC to the primary artery. And it even that increase the primary pressure will decrease the circulation and cause a hand failure. There are two types of hand procedures. The first one is fenestrated in dry atrial fontan. This is the fenestration is connected between the fontan surface and the common atrium to serve as a pop up valve for maintenance of cardiac output during time of increased pulmonary pressure. So some hypoxemia from the oxygenated blood pass through the fenestration. The second one is the unfenestrated extra cardiac fontan. As I mentioned before about single ventricle, that left ventricle base ventricle is better. But return to the lung the same past the from the upper body and lower body, from the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava respectively. So any factor that increase pulmonary vascular pressure can decrease pulmonary blood flow and contribute to fontan failure. Fontan, what is fontan failure? It is characterized by an adequate cardiac output, the CPLA of which includes elevated central venous pressure, pleural fusion ascites, and peripheral edema. After fontan procedures, normal fontan patients should have a normal oxygen saturation except the patients who have a fontan finisterate. They should have slightly reduced in Often circulation due to a small degree of right blood channel across the fenestrations. Persistent oxygen desaturation should raise the concern of failing content circulations. Problem that can occur associated with content patient is content associated liver disease from the liver congestion of chronic kidney disease from multi failure. And the other important issue is protein losing enteropathy that occur about 12%. This can cause malabsorption and it has no failure, hypoalbuminemia, and plastic bronchitis that can be a big task in the area that might interfere with of, uh, our uh, general anesthesia here. This is the basic way of consideration for patients with content circulation. The quine non cardiac surgery is the pre op uh, preparation and examination that we should know everything about the cardiac. Echo, echo cardiography, especially when there is the cardiac arrhythmia, and it has major medication and treatment, liver and renal function in abdomen. For inter operative, we should have the stable cardiac function, stable preload. Anything that can increase the pulmonary pressure to be a warning. And carefully, if you want to use the neuroxia anesthesia to prevent the decreasing preload. And good course of care in this patient. For the specific pre operative assessment of the form 10 patient, we should know about the content procedures, time of the form 10. If it has been done beyond the four years ago, the outcome is not as good as about before three years old. Either they are finished or not finished. And recent pathology, pathophysiology, and evidence of content failure. We should know of the circulation, restricted physical exercise, polycythemia, kidney and liver dysfunction, and vocal status. Anticoagulant medication in this treatment, and the need for infective endocarditis for practice, and recent illness, especially respiratory system, GI system that needs to be resolved four weeks before selective surgery. Because content patients lack a ventricle to provide pulmonary blood flow and allylin on passive flow to the lung, therefore adequate payload is critical to maintain the cardiac output. So we try to avoid long interior time and if they have a long interior time, we should be to, to maintain payload of these patients, especially the scientific patients. 
for instance, uh, operating MSP consideration, we should not put monitoring that should uh, add the monitoring that can access the hemodynamic status, polymic status, and also the bleeding that uh, we can use airlines, UTOGE, if they are questioned about the other function, and anesthetic technique. We avoid the technique that uh, actually decreases fear, such as final anesthesia technique that increases in data and infra abdominal pressure, for example, laparoscopic, and the optimum try to optimum the and sometimes we need to replace albumin for the colloid status, avoid drug that depends on that function, avoid factor that increase pulmonary pressure, for example, high tidal volume, high T, and we should have adequate oxygenation and ventilation, and uh, a little bit tighter ventilation to keep you around for part three. Avoid drug that increase renal liver function, for example, hydroxy acetate to Avoid hypothermia and they should have the course of good course of care monitoring. Come up with a vocation. This is the risky content patients because they have the aortic mechanical valve replacement and also they have the, they had the liver and kidney dysfunction and had some kind of hypoalbuminemia and had hypoglycemia. Also had the septic with appendicitis and electrolyte imbalance. For pain management for myself, surgery I will discuss with the surgeon and cardiologist that this appendectomy should be delayed or not, or this appendicitis can be treated with medical, and if they can concern, I will do take the anesthesia for open appendectomy instead of laparoscopic appendectomy to decrease to avoid the increase in the glycosic pressure after follow dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. For preoperative planning, I will talk to the cardiologist to recall the antiquarium and other concerns of my abuse patient, especially the last cardiac status. I would collect dehydration. This is a blood and blood component and consult for space with antibiotic and prophylaxis endocarditis, antibiotic and visit ICU process. For anesthesia disease management, I will go with the directory to monitor with the arterial line, central with renal pressure and urinal pressure. Phase five, this is a very small um, uh, operation, but I like to have an arterial line that they can monitor the blood pressure all the time and also this can be used as a power pressure variation to access the volume and COP to access the preload for the plant cancer too. And for the adequacy of tissue perfusion we do with the capillary review and peripheral perfusion in the and urine output. And I will prevent hypertension, hypovolemia and anything that can increase in thyroid and in abdominal pressure and hypotonia. I will go with rapid sequence induction and carefully induce with the agent that not depressed for that function, for example, ketamine. Go with balance and anesthesia. Carefully ventilate to avoid too high tidal volume. I will go with 6 to 8 cc per kilo and keep about two centimeters water and avoid CO2 retention and both electricity and mechanic basis. With my hyperventilation with pH 7.3 to produce to provoke more pulmonary blood flow. Maintain the volume giving fluid by not so much fluid, but I will look at the CFP. PPV, capillary and peripheral position index. And also need to keep normal term yet. If the pick had fever, I kind of but a little bit warm the patient to prevent hypothermia in the uh, operating room that might provoke in person pulmonary pressure. And if they have a bleeding, I would keep that to keep the hemoglobin the same as it did have before. And replace button care for the bleeding.
if the surgery went well without any problem with the small infusion, I would expect the patient with good pain relief and uh, some kind of local anesthesia if it can be done. But if the surgery went into expensive and need uh, more fluid and blood replacement, I would keep intubated and I will support the surgery both of key point and take home message. Children after frontal surgery undergoing non cardiac surgery are at high risk for perioperative adverse event. Total understanding of lesions, current status, and pathophysiology is very important. Multidisciplinary approach, especially cardiology, is important also. Quick diagnostic technique. We should have good monitoring technique that avoid hypovolemia, preserve cardiac function, preserve in increase in prevent increase in intracardiac and increase that abdominal pressure, maintain good pillow, avoid factor that could increase pumper pressure, for example, too high tidal volume, CO2 retention, and also should have the good post of monitoring and care and good pain management. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Professor Sunirat. This is very informative talk and very challenging patient, um, actually. So um, I think here we are in the Q&A session. There's some question in, um, in the Q&A box. But um, anyway, I understand that everyone are quite curious about the poll question we posted earlier. And let we shall see um, the result and we may change our mind after we listen to the talk. So let's put up the poll questions again. So the first poll question for uh, Dr. Maliwan. So which is considered a higher risk case that requires a pediatric cardiac anesthesiology support for non-cardiac surgery. I understand that we don't have um, not a uh, cardiac anesthesiologist uh, who are doing uh, pediatric cases, especially in, in everywhere. But if we can, which kind of patient that we, we would like to ask for their help? So seems like in the, in the uh, poll, the uncorrected VSD with moderate pulmonary artery hypertension for appendectomy is um, is answered. Um, like eighty two percent of of the audience choose this. What do you think, Dr. Maliwan? Yes, if anyone uh, listen to my talk, you can notice that uh, the one slide that show the high risk case for cardiac condition and recommendation for trained cardiac anesthesiologists to take care, which were first, the patient who have single ventricular lesion, the second, the fontan circulation or receive fontan procedure, the third is the um, pulmonary hypertension, brilliant syndrome, which have high likely of uh, supra uh, aortic stenosis, and also cardiomyopathy, with three of them already account for 70 75% of that. So for this question, clearly uh, there's a moderate pulmonary hypertension in one choice set. So it's according to the high risk for my talk. Yes. And also for the second question, uh, there are two uh, indication to have IE prophylaxis first, is that meet the, is that met the cardiac condition, and second, is that met the surgical procedure. And when we try to screen, the only surgical procedure that we find that is indicated is dental surgery. And then we say it in dental surgery is fit for uh, cardiac, that cardiac condition is also one of the indication with, of course, the DORV who has uh, only three months 
procedure still within the six months also and receive dental procedure. So it, this one is clearly that is indication for IE prophylaxis. But for the other, um, most cardiac conditions are met, but not for the procedure. Because according to new guideline after 2007, uh, not only dental surgery, they also advise for respiratory tract procedure and also uh, some um, skin or musculoskeletal procedure because high risk of step aureus infection or strep uh, cocoa infection that go to the airway. So that's why most likely to have IE prophylaxis. Yeah, so I think these two questions is clear from the slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Maliwan, and thank you for your answer. So I understand that um, we all understand more about how to do preoperative preparation and, and how to um, select uh, if the patient is having uh, high cardiac risk or not, so that we will be able to provide the best care for the most benefit of the patient. Thank you, Dr. Maliwan. So. Okay, um, we will now move on to the second poll question that actually came up um, related to Dr. Natapong's talk. So which was the earliest warning sign of pulmonary hypertension? 57% uh, actually mentioned desaturation, 33% mentioned tachycardia, and uh, 7 selected hypotension. Uh, Dr. Natapong, could you give us some insight into this question? Yes. Uh, for the answer of the earliest sign for pulmonary hypertension, the first earlier size desaturation because uh, when the pulmonary blood flow is suddenly decreased, so the VQ mismatch should occur suddenly. So the first size desaturation. What, what, um, how about, what, after desaturation, what do we usually, um, what's the next thing that we might actually observe in a patient? Hello? After the desaturation, what is the next thing that we might observe in a patient? Yes, uh, the, next, the next one is uh, hypotension because of the desaturation can cause hypoxemia, so uh, it can uh, affect the myocardial function. So if myocardial function is decreased, the cardiac output should uh, also decrease too. So the next side is uh, hypotension. Right, okay. But I understand that if the patient does have a right to left shunt, then blood pressure may be still maintained uh, for a while before it starts to drop. Is that right? Yes, right. Because uh, the myocardial function should, should decline. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Nafong. Thank you. Thank you for answering the poll question. So for the next poll question, we have a patient with BT shunt presents with sudden desaturation. It is crucial to rule out which condition between shunt blockade. My major aortopulmonary collaterals, BT shunt too large or dry atrial thrombus. So I would like to invite Dr. Grit to answer this. Well, I think uh, most of us know that um, the shunt blockage is the common cause of um, desaturation in patients with BT shunt. The other causes, like um, MACUS or chance too large, causes um, high saturation in patients with BT shunt. But the chunk, um, blockade can cause from thrombosis or maybe from um, hypovolemia. That we have to differentiate this. If they have hypovolemia, we need to give volume. But if they have thrombosis, we need to give like um, anticoagulant. So it's very important to differentiate diagnosis, what the causes of um, shunt blockading. Thank you so much, Dr. Grit, for answering this poll question. Hey, now we have come to our last two questions. We will just wait for... Okay, so the last two questions are related to a 4 and 10 patient, uh, and we'll get Dr. S Professor Sunira to actually answer this. So I think it's a bit of a... 42% of people actually said no to performing a laparoscopic surgery in a well for time presenting for non-cardiac surgery. But actually, there are 29 who say yes and 29 who say maybe. Dr. Sunira, what are your thoughts on this? Yo, thank you very much uh, for the poll. But uh, uh, usually for the fan 10 patient, because it, it's passive flow, 
from the lower extremity and upper extremity to uh, the pulmonary artery, anything that can increase intra-abdominal pressure or intra-thoracic pressure can decrease blood flow to the lungs and cause the fontan failure or decreasing cardiac output and desaturation in the fontan patient. So uh, usually we try to avoid laparoscopic surgery for this patient, even though we can do it in the head down position procedures, but the venous return uh, to the lung do not be adequate for these patients. And uh, it, it, it's quite dangerous for these patients. So uh, I don't recommend for this. Okay, and then we have the second question. In the Fontaine patient presented with acute appendicitis, most people have chosen to proceed with surgery after optimization. Yeah, but the, uh, uh, the first thing we can talk uh, to the surgeon and cardiac, cardiac cardiologist whether uh, this uh, appendicitis can treat with medical because some of the appendicitis we can treat with medical but uh, for this patient the patient had aortic valve replacement in the high risk to have a, a bacterial nocarditis uh, from the sepsis so uh, for myself and uh, I did talk to the surgeon and cardiac uh, cardiologist before. They said that this patient, uh, they rather like to, to do open appendectomy after we stabilize the patient before. Not immediately, but uh, after we hydrate the patient, collect electrolyte, because in 4 and 10 patients, we just have one ventricle. If the patient had cardiac arrhythmia, it would be dangerous for this patient. So a uh, correct electrolyte, give adequate antibiotic for a day, and then we go for open epidemic. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sanira. Thank you for answering your questions. So I think we all have a better idea of how to manage a patient, a Fontaine patient coming in for surgery. We will now look into the um, chat questions. Um, I think um, there was one question that was already answered by Dr. Maliwan. The patient who um, has a newborn for emergency non-cardiac surgery, 2.7 kilos, two-day-old, imperfect anus. Uh, total TA has a TAPVC um, and asking for recommendations. I think Dr. Maliwan has already answered. Dr. Maliwan, maybe you would like to um, get, uh, tell your answers uh, to the rest of the um. Of yeah, I, I think maybe it's TAPVR, like total abnormal or pulmonary venous return. That means uh, that that baby, there is, there is no connection between pulmonary artery and uh, left atrium. So so that by uh, the pulmonary artery or pulmonary vein connect to the right atrium. So it's like a uh, left to right shunt and also obstruction. Usually it's obstruction right there at the right atrium. And also uh, because there's no connection on the left side. so a baby need to have a ASD for the right to left shunt, otherwise cannot survive. So this is very high risk, like more than 50%, not any, not to receive any surgery, already high risk, 50% mortality. And then if the baby need to come for the surgery, because uh, I don't know. So uh, if they need, I, I, I really need to discuss with the pediatrician that uh, what is the baby condition because it's just two days old, how is the circulation look like? Uh, how is the bad of the heart function, whatever. And also ask with the, discuss with the surgeon that you really need it because, but, because, because, but we all know that uh, the inappropriate energy is also emergency condition necessary. If we need it, then we need to be prepared and also discuss with the CVT surgeon, and also we need train pediatric, kines, kin, pediatric kin, uh, cardiac anesthesiologist, and also you know that you need to balance between PVR and SVR. And you know what, we, before we, we try to do some spinal block for some baby's procedure like uh, imperfect NS, but not with this baby because the SVR will be too low and then you cannot um, stay for the cardiac output. So that means we need to do general anesthesia. So if you do, General anesthesia, we need to find also the answers that abnormally because it might have airway, um, abnormally airway compression. You need to find out any associate abnormally and we need to put the tube in because the baby is too little. You, you cannot put the airway or something else. So you need to do general anesthesia. And if you do one thing wrong, 
an imbalance of PVR and SVR, so the baby get in trouble. So you should connect with the CVT surgeon to get ready for the ECMO of cardiopulmonary bypass because it's very high risk already without surgery. So <laughs> it's very if, if if you are in the center with not have cardio cardiac pediatric anesthesiologist, I think maybe you should refer for the baby or just talk to risk with the parents or uh, with all the team. Yeah, it's very high risk. Yes. Thank you for answering the questions. I right. wonder if any, any other speakers in the panel have any other um, uh, recommendations uh, for Dr. Tao? Yeah, I, uh, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Maliwan. This is a very, very high risk uh, patient with uh, TAPVR that uh, we should have a team discussion before, urgent team discussion. And the first one, if we can refer the patient to the center, we can. And both are emergency. And if the kid collapse, the main center to put the ECMO on. Why can we do the inappropriate ANAS and emergent repair of a TAPVR in the same setting that might be. But uh, we need to, to do the heart. For myself, I like to do the heart just a palliative before we do the lectum because uh, if we do the lectum before and we go to cardio probably bypass we will have a lot of bleeding so we do the heart and uh, put the kid on ECMO if uh, they cannot pass through the surgery and then do the imperfect anus with the ECMO with done mm -hmm. every night ECMO that mm -hmm. may be another choice so it's it we should refer to the center that can do that So, Professor Sinirat, you are saying that um, this patient might need to be go might need to go on ECMO first, and ECMO we will then uh repair the imperfect anus. Is that yeah, yeah. I I I will discuss with the surgeon right. because of this kind of uh, patient need an emergency surgery for the heart, mm -hmm. and somehow they cannot uh they cannot coming up of ECMO. Mm -hmm. And we have to go with the uh, we have more with the with the with the neck because we cannot put the camera on the on the leg. And then after the heart repair, and we collect pathology, and then we go with the imperfect anus mm -hmm. after we have the ECMO support or we right. collect somehow with the heart because right. uh, imperfect anus can wait for a day or two, but the heart lesion of this one. Usually, mm -hmm. we come like an emergency procedures. Especially if it's obstructed, right? If there's any yeah, sign yeah, yeah. of obstruction that yeah, really yeah, push yeah. it into an emergency situation. Yeah, this is a very good question. Thank you, Professor Sunny Wright. Okay, um, I think we have another question. Um, Dr. Chaya, we like to... Um, I think, oh, sorry, I think we, sorry, yeah, we have another question I, in the chat. I think that the, the last question in the chat box is, uh, what do you think about dexmedetomidine in this patient? Um, in, for in, the uh, in detrimental effects, both for pre-med and sedation. So I, I think this question is probably the answer by everyone because we have different kind of Set, setting for each patient. So, so um, I, I am going to start with Dr. Uh, Prof. Sunirat to begin with, that if the patient post Fontan, that um, going to have um, some procedures, can we give dexmedetomidine to the patient for, for example, like for pre-medication or sedation? Dexmedetomidine, uh, currently we have report uh, from our uh, Department of Pediatric that uh, they have uh, persistent bradycardia from dexmedetomidine last for almost seven days because sensitive half time was seven days. And uh, for my opinion, I try to avoid dexmedetomidine in, in the patient with, especially for the little patient that uh, we still need to keep the heart rate going on. And if we give it, we have to be very, very careful and give a very small dose just uh, when you would like to put a pick line on. But for personally, I, I kind of avoid it because uh, it can last for long. And we have that patient put a pacemaker also. 
Yeah, thank you. That's just my opinion. Thank you, Prof. Sunirat. I think that the patient with, you know, post frontal is kind of high risk and with dexmedetomidine is kind of difficult to titrate and control the, the effect, although it looks mild to, to, um, to pediatric population, but in this kind of populate um, this kind of setup is kind of different that we have to be very careful. So um, for the patient who is kind of better, I mean, if the patient's not really complex, like uh, if, if the patient with Down syndrome, as Dr. Natapong already mentioned earlier, that really not cooperative. And if the patient having BSD with um, some questionable pulmonary hypertension, can we still do dexmedetomidine in this case for pre-medication? I think uh, we should keep the patient with Down syndrome uh, with uh, some kind of uh, pulmonary hypertension, but should, uh, should be careful about uh, bradycardia for, for the kind of patients so because of Down syndrome is prone to have a bradycardia. Yeah, I, I agree that uh... Um, we should not over sedate the patient, especially if you're going to use any pre-medication, we should get familiar with that. For me, myself, I don't, I don't familiar with uh, using dexmethamidine, even in the adult, I don't. So for the children, uh, no, I will not use it. <laughs> yeah, we know that it have hypotension and bradycardia, and also we don't know that how much we need to use for get sedated, and we don't need that much sedated for this kind of patient anyway. So just let the, the baby just um, awake and we can come down with the other thing like fentanyl we can titrate or um, with us lamb, I think it's easier to control and, and you get and you very familiar with those drugs, not the new drug that you're not familiar with. Yes. Well, for my personal experience, well, I use Dexmed sometimes, but I don't do loading. I just use small dose like um, 0, 0 0.2 for sedating. Yes, and, and use some other choices, like um, maybe added some fentanyl. I don't want, um, if you give too much opioid, it can cause apnea. So if I use Dexmed, I can use less opioid. That's why I like um, Dexmed, and it's good for um, cyanotic heart disease patients because it doesn't cause tachycardia. Mm -hmm. But in general, I use it um, in ICU mostly, not in, in the OR. So Dr. Creed, are you saying that you use this um, use it Presidex and Fentanyl as a sedation agent in the ICU? Is that what you're referring to? Yes. In my hospital, yes. Right. Would you use it for uh, any like sedation procedures? Like for example, a pig line insertion? For um procedural procedure? Yeah. Yes. But like I said, I don't do loading. Okay. So but I just add some other like um fentanyl or ketamine along that with um dexmed. Right. Is there any um any cardiac lesion or condition that you will not use um Presidex? Well, I use small dose, so I don't have experience with um any side effects like um bradycardia or hypotension. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing. Yeah, I, I, wonder I, had, I had more more. Yes, we have to avoid uh, mixing the dexmethotomidin and propofol. It's very, very dangerous because some, some, some attending or someone like to mix with dexmethotomidin and propofol for sedation. That that is very dangerous. So if you want to use it, uh, try to avoid each one and. If they have bradycardia, stop dexmethotomidine first, and then you can go on with propofol or use ketamine instead, like Dr. Prick said. But uh, uh, presidex and propofol is very dangerous, especially for the kids. Thank you, Professor. Um, so I, I think this is a really interesting topic, especially because Presidex is uh, somewhat new um, to us in pediatrics. I wonder if anybody in the audience um, have some experiences to share about using Presidex in um, pediatric population, um, especially with uh, kids with congenital heart um, conditions. 
If you do, you can unmute yourself and speak uh, and, and um, voice your opinions. Hi. Uh, I'm using it as a premedication, uh, but uh, I agree with Dr. Crit that uh, the loading dose uh, causes uh, really bradycardia. And if you use less doses, it's more uh, efficient and more safe. But you have to be very careful to give it slowly and do not flush the line uh, if the DEX is going. Mm -hmm. uh, then we can experience really bad uh, bradycardia. Not in cardiac patients, uh, but the uh, others also. Thank you for uh, the uh, excellent webinar. Thank you, Dr. Candy, Dr. Sophia. Thank you for sharing. So I, from what I hear is that uh, even in non-cardiac patients with the loading dose, they can have bradycardia and we should, uh, even though we can use it in uh, cardiac patients, but we really should be um, cautious about the um, loading dose that we give. Is there anyone in the audience who might have any other questions for our speakers today? I see we have... Um... Anyone who like to um, raise up your questions? Okay, if not, um, we will have uh, some, we'll share our slides. Okay, thank you very much for participating in today's forum. Um, I thank the, um, I especially like to thank the speakers um, as well as Dr. Pichaya here today um, for being with us throughout the um, this uh, evening on Saturday. This is the QR code for the certificate of attendance. Please scan um, and fill in your full name as well as your email address. Um, there is a survey uh, with regards to the forum as well as about five MCQ questions for you to answer. Once you have completed that, um, the, survey, um, the certificate of attendance will be emailed to you. Again, um, I do apologize um, that not everyone could have joined this uh, forum. I would definitely um, have been livelier if we could have everyone with us. Um, but this um, forum will be recorded. Um, this forum will be recorded, and we can uh, view it on the ESPA website as well as Facebook and as well as YouTube. Um, this is a small shout out for everybody. Um, so ESPA is actually a non profit organization. Um, ESPA's mission is to foster the highest standards of pediatric care in, in Asia. And hence, we seek your help to donate and help us in our cause. We also want to um, let everyone know that uh, ESPA is happening this year, 2023, in Korea, um, in June this year. So if you have yet to sign up, uh, please uh, do sign up for it. Um, and you can have a good holiday in Korea. So for everyone, um, this is the QR code for the sign up for the next talk. Uh, we will also post this on uh, our Facebook as well. Um, so for those who are here, you can scan the QR code and sign up. Uh, also, I just want to like mention for those who couldn't sign, uh, scan the QR code for the certificate of attendance. Um, I have included the link in the chat group, so you can click on the link and it will lead you to the um certificate of. Uh, it will lead you to the uh, MCQ as well as survey questions. Okay, so you can access from there or the QR code, please. Again, I would like to thank everyone for being here today. Thank you to all four speakers who are here. Um, thank you for all the hard work and effort that you have put in. I hope everyone um, has learned as much as I did today. And um, I hope to see you guys. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Espa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all.